Splatoon is a game that I feel like was poorly marketed in the US. It made people view Splatoon more as a kids game, which usually means it lacks more of the depth that more mature games have. It's a sentiment that I see passed around a lot, that Splatoon is nothing more than baby's first shooter. And how could you blame them? The commercial says you're a kid like a billion times. But once you play the game and get more familiar with its world, it paints a much darker picture of itself. This is Nintendo's darkest franchise, and it's not even close. Splatoon takes place in the real world, like the one that you currently inhabit, just much farther into the future, and in a future where humans no longer exist. They were wiped out by a war, but not World War III, World War V. During this war, and for reasons currently unknown, a nuke was launched into the South Pole. And remember, this is the future, this is a much bigger nuke than what we have today. All of the heat caused by the nuke melted all of the ice caps, and this resulted in a lot of water. Enough water to flood the entire planet. Humans weren't entirely unprepared though. The humans very quickly began began to build a giant arc. Oh wait, wrong lore. The humans very quickly dug underground, creating these large dome-like structures that would be their new habitats. Unfortunately, all this really did was delay the inevitable. One by one, generation by generation, these colonies would eventually fall, except for one, Alterna. When appointing leaders, Alterna chose their scientists to be the highest in charge. They believed that these would be the ones capable of bringing us back to the surface if it ever re-emerged. During this time, one scientist learned how to refine liquid crystals from the body fluids of squids. These crystals would then project the wants and desires of humans onto them. It, it's, don't look too far into it, it's like future sci-fi tech shit. These crystals would then be mass-produced and lined along the walls of the dome, and since what everyone really wanted was freedom, it would project an image of the sky. Alterna seemed to have been doing great. Maybe the human race wasn't doomed to extinction after all. Unfortunately, the next generation wouldn't be as lucky. The leaders of this generation grew more and more impatient, and they got to work. They built a giant rocket that they planned on using to get back to the surface, but unfortunately, this would be their downfall. During its first test launch, the energy from the boosters was so powerful that it overloaded the crystal lining on the dome and caused a catastrophic cave-in. This would kill almost everybody in Alterna, except for a few who would die to starvation now that their food was cut off. And this was officially the end of humankind. But for marine life, it was just beginning. The liquid crystal now raining from the sky very quickly polluted Alterna's bodies of water, where it would meet the marine life within. It imbued them with the remnants of emotions that were stored by humans, and it very quickly accelerated the evolutionary process. And 12,000 years later, humans. Base, basically. The marine life now carried humanity's desire to escape the underground, and they would eventually find the tunnels that the humans used to initially escape the apocalypse. Why the humans didn't just use those in the first place? Maybe they deserve to go extinct? Regardless, they made it, and the surface of the Earth was once again beaming with life. Luckily, all of these creatures got along, and they were able to create a world that humans failed to. One where they didn't care about the minor differences between each other, and they got along. They were able to build a better world together. Just kidding, race war. The squid would evolve into inklings, while the octopi would evolve into octolings. You can very obviously tell that they're not that different, and they actually got along for a good while too. But then the sea levels began to rise, swallowing up the remaining land again, and this would spark conflict. This would mark the beginning of the Great Turf War. For a while, it seemed like the octolings were the ones to soon claim victory, but then the inklings came back using some pretty insane methods. Not like the octolings didn't have a bunch of war weapons, it seemed like the Geneva Convention died off with humans. But the inklings and their nukes winning the war, they would would force the remaining octoling back underground where they came from, where the human race was buried and left to rot, the place they were born to escape. The Inklings were now living lavishly on the surface, and since their evolution was guided by human desire, their societal development was strikingly human-like. I mean, they played games, they made music, they had a rich fashion scene, they had celebrities. Cannibalism? Why is it well established? that Inklings are cannibals. Whatever, how are the Octolings doing? Damn, not too bad actually. They happen to be quite good at repurposing old human technology and creating new things out of it. And with that, they would actually thrive pretty well underground. Unless of course, they came across Commander Tartar, who had been watching the Inklings and Octolings this entire time.
Commander Tartar is a borderline sentient telephone created by a once great human scientist to pass down the knowledge of humanity to the next promising species, may there be one. Basically a tutorial for everything that the next humans would have access to on day one. So Tartar waited and he waited for 12,000 years. He waited and then there it was life, intelligent life. As he watched the Inklings and Octolings, he actually grew quite hopeful of the future. He was ready to do what he was made to do, but then he kept watching. He watched as they grew an overwhelming obsession for fashion, something so meaningless. He watched as they waged entire wars over the most minor of differences. As he watched, he grew angrier and angrier, but what is a telephone gonna do? So now that the Octolings, which are well established to be equal to humans, are underground, they'll eventually come across a place known as the Deep Sea Metro. This is where Tartar is conducting his plan. He entices the Octolings by saying that he can get them back to the Promised Land. The Promised Land obviously being the surface where the Octolings used to call home for like a few minutes. As you can imagine, his actual plan was a lot different. He blended people. I'm not, look, that, that's a blender. He blended people into a fine paste, not before making them go through his rigorous trials to make sure they're worthy. These trials are what make up the gameplay in Splatoon 2 Octo Expansion, and let me tell you, as someone who's played it, that is the hardest piece of gameplay in the entirety of the Splatoon franchise. He was not going easy on these people. So why was he blending people into a paste? Is he just twisted like that? Like he, he just loves watching his victims squirm around in a, in a blender while a, while a spinning bed of knives slowly lowers upon them? While exactly what he does to it is unknown, what we do know is that he turns it into what is called blended ink using the DNA inside the, the slush. This ink can then be used to sanitize inklings and octolings. When you're sanitized, you lose all of your memories, completely wiping your sense of self. It drains you of life's energies. It essentially zombifies you and turns you into a husk of your form Self. Let me paraphrase that for you. This telephone slowly blends living people into a paste and then uses the paste to lobotomize people. Sanitized Octolings follow Tartar's every order, probably because they're just being born. Instead of abiding by its purpose and helping the Inklings and Octolings through social development, it decides to attempt full control. All he had to do was get enough blended ink to sanitize everybody. And he was going to use this. That big ass cannon is full of blended ink. Luckily, you're playing as the Octoling, so you win somehow. It just sucks that you won only after Tartar killed 10,000 other Octolings. And you were supposed to be 10,008. Tartar is truly as evil as it gets. This video isn't meant to be a comprehensive analysis of Splatoon lore. There's a lot that I didn't go over. I just wanted to cover what I consider to be its darkest story and how it contrasts to the view that Americans have of this game. But there really is like so much that I couldn't get to. Like, did you know that every single song in Splatoon is written by an in-game music group or artist? That is some of the coolest attention to world building I have ever seen. My favorite artist is Deadfish, a partially sanitized Octoling who actually willingly became sanitized. Most of them is gone, but they're still in there somewhere. If you rewind back to the intro during this sequence, I actually used one of Deadfish's songs. In fact, to be clear, every single song in this entire video is a Splatoon song. All right, one more thing. Channel members not only watched this video early, but they also got a ton of behind the scenes info, such as like early scripts and early version of the intro, uh, early thumbnails that I never used. If you would be interested in seeing that kind of stuff from me, becoming a channel member is only $2.99 and you get all those benefits. You also get a bunch of custom emojis to use on my channel and a custom shout out in every video. Here's an example. Shout out to PigG13 and really for being channel members, it, it truly, it means the world to me. Knowing that you enjoy my content enough to either donate or seek out those additional rewards is just fucking amazing. But also literally everybody else. You watched the whole video and then proceeded to, to stay after all that? Thank you all so much for making my dream come true. We're getting close to 100K now and it, it, it feels unreal. <laughs> I'm about to have a silver play button, my dumbass. So one more, just thank you all and I hope you enjoyed the video.